Josh Haston here, Israel Uncensored, and the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. It is Monday, March 25th, 2019. It is the 18th of Adar Bet, 5779. Hope everyone out there had a wonderful Purim holiday, those who celebrate the holiday of Purim. It certainly was a joyous time. It seems like it was so long ago already. Because here we are on Monday morning in Jerusalem, and just several hours ago, a rocket was fired from Gaza, hitting a moshav, a community in the center of the country in the Sharon region, um, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, as they are called, taking credit for this rocket. And it was a direct hit on a house, an Israeli house, uh with seven, according to Magen David Adom, seven reported injuries, including a 60-year-old woman who was in moderate condition with shrapnel wounds, a 30-year-old woman in moderate condition, uh, rather a 30-year-old woman in moderate condition, also with shrapnel wounds, five people who were slightly injured. If I'm talking a little bit fast, I mean, the news is coming in fast and furious, listening to the radio on the way here with updates on the situation. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who is in Washington right now, scheduled to meet in a few hours with President Donald Trump. Uh, He has decided to shorten his trip and come back as a result of the rocket fire into the Sharon region. Uh, He will be meeting with the president, and then apparently he will not be speaking at APAC. That uh, speech was scheduled for tomorrow. Other victims at the scene treated for shock. I know there were animals killed. So here you have another escalation coming out of Gaza. Uh, Last week you had two rockets fired into Tel Aviv, which some say were, were a mistake. Some sort of rocket technician made a mistake and pressed the button. That looks, I think, less likely at this point with another rocket scoring a direct hit on a house in the center of the country. And um, I've expressed it on the show before. I mean, my problem is, and I understand the prime minister is cutting cutting his trip short. He's coming back. Would he have cut his trip short if a rocket hit a house in Sterot? That's the question, and I, I, it seems that there's this double standard that if you fire into the center of the country, then it warrants emergency meetings by the top military brass. It warrants the prime minister canceling his speech at APAC and coming back early. I don't understand. Maybe somebody out there can explain to me what seems to be this double standard, which bothers me very much, that the, the lives of the residents of southern Israel somehow are not as important as those as, as those in the center of the country. That's the perception that I'm getting. I mean, the south of Israel has had thousands and thousands of rockets. And I understand ultimately Israel went into Gaza three separate times. But the responses that we're seeing and the, just the overall attitude makes me sad. It makes me sad to think that someone would believe that a rocket on Tel Aviv is different from a moral perspective than a rocket on steroid. I know the majority of the country lives in the greater Tel Aviv area. I understand that. I get that. But each and every rocket, wherever they fall here in Israel, should be, I believe, treated accordingly. And I also don't subscribe. I was listening to the radio on the way here, and they were talking about when a rocket hits a building and people are injured, that is deemed to be Uh, more severe than when a rocket lands in an open field. I think that that should not be the policy. It should not be the policy um, to respond based on the damage that the rocket does. I think it should be viewed in the same light whether or not a rocket hits directly. Just because the rocket didn't hit the exact target or hit a target and cause damage or, God forbid, worse... That doesn't mean Israel should 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 have a policy of a less of a response. What are we waiting for? Are we saying that we're waiting for, God forbid, a school to get hit in a rocket attack and kids to be, God forbid, who knows what, before Israel will respond? Just because it's a near miss and this morning was a direct hit and thank God nobody's in life-threatening uh, danger, just because of that, a response should not be uh, weaker. 
That's my opinion on the matter. Let me know what you think. Josh at thelandofisrael.com. On Facebook, it's Joshua Haston. Or my new page, Josh Haston Israel Advocacy and Journalism. On Twitter, at Josh Haston. And now on Instagram as well. We are actually going to be speaking to Israel Maidad Winky, as he is known, from the Menachem Begin Heritage Center. Also a columnist at the Jerusalem Post, a historian. Just a, a uh, an amazing... A uh, person with so much with vast information on so many different things. We're going to be talking to him the the, the whole uh, coming into this morning. I was going to focus on the fact that the U.S. Uh, President Trump tweeted that the uh, United States was going to recognize Israeli sovereignty over the Golan. I mean, that was going to be top story, and we will still talk to Israel Maidan about that. The announcement, I heard Ron Dermer speak at APEC very early this morning, Israel time, late last night in the U.S., uh, that recognition, U.S. recognition over Israeli sovereignty over the Golan may in fact come during the meeting between Netanyahu and Trump, perhaps by the time you are hearing this broadcast. So that is uh, also uh, major news. At the same time, from APAC, both Romania and Honduras uh, indicating at least in their respective talks there at APAC that they were going to be moving the embassy uh, of their country, of their nations, to Jerusalem. The Jerusalem Post front page this uh, this morning says, the leaders of Romania and Honduras separately told the APAC conference on Sunday their countries will relocate the embassies to Jerusalem, but it's not clear whether either of the moves will actually materialize. You have the Romanian prime minister who made the statement only to be rebuffed by the Romanian president. And then Honduras uh, said that maybe we're not exactly talking about an embassy, maybe we're talking about some kind of other office, sort of like a consulate, but not really an embassy. So we'll have to see how it plays out. I mean, it definitely played out well in front of the crowd there at APAC yesterday. Um, but we'll have to see if, in fact, Romania, Romania and Honduras will join the U.S., and I believe, who is it, Guatemala that also has a, an embassy in Jerusalem? Yes, it's only Guatemala who followed the U.S. lead and fully moved its embassy to Jerusalem. So um, a lot of action over there at APAC, and we'll have to see how things change now that Prime Minister Netanyahu apparently will not be speaking at that policy conference. Uh, at the same time, uh, another meeting was taking place just several days ago, the U.N., Human, so-called Human Rights Council, this sham of a group getting together time and time again, uh, calling out Israel as required in their mandate in line item number seven each and every time they meet. Nothing really different. This time, the UN Human Rights Council voted 23 to 8 for an ar arms embargo against Israel and the prosecution of of Israelis for war crimes over IDF action along the Gaza border. Of course, they don't talk about Hamas. They don't mention any Hamas um, attempts to infiltrate our country and murder the first Jew they see, uh, the violent riots at the border, the attempted infiltrations. All that stuff is ignored. Instead, the focus is, focuses on Israel. That resolution was one of five anti-Israel resolutions, which the UNHRC approved on Friday in Geneva as it wrapped up its 40th session. The only uh, Australia, the only country who voted against all five of the te of the texts, uh, neither Israel nor the U.S. are members of the council. So thank you very much to the moral and wonderful country down under Australia for standing up for what's right and being on the right side of history here there at the UNHRC, which is obsessed, obsessed with Israel and has more resolutions condemning Israel um, than all the other countries combined. Um, as I mentioned, according to the J Post, the report did not ask Hamas to stop sending militants to the border disguised as civilians or to stop the explosive balloons um, or explosive devices or or any of that other stuff that Hamas does. Um, here also you have the UNHRC voting 26 to 16 to condemn Israel's what they call occupation of the Golan Heights. Uh, of course, bringing that up in contradiction of President Trump's decision that the Golan is and will always be 
Israel. And there's so many different reasons why the Golan Israel, which we'll talk with Israel Maidat about in just a few minutes. Just a few other items here before we go to the interview. Remember the terror attack we spoke about last Sunday? Uh, two Israelis murdered Rabbi Achiad Ettinger, father of 12 from Eli, and IDF Staff Sergeant Gal Kedan from Be'er Sheva. Well, the village of Burkin there in the Shomron decided to name their main street after the terrorist, the terrorist who carried out the attack, Omar Abu Lila, the murderer who carried out this atrocious uh, jihadi-inspired attack. He's going to get a street named after him. Israel, since we've last spoken, Israel killed the terrorist uh, in a raid um, which in, actu- in actuality, which uh, resulted in the terrorists uh, exchanging gunfire with our IDF, our brave IDF soldiers. The terrorist is no longer, thank God. Um, but there is a street going to be named after him. And this is par for the course. This happen- happens time and time again throughout areas under the Palestinian Authority. Our so-called peace partners, right, naming streets um, after terrorists people ask me time and time again will there ever be peace here as long as that's the case as long as the next generation of arab children growing up hating jews um there'll never be peace here that's just that's just the way it is one last news item here which some are saying perhaps is there's a correlation between what uh, this news item and the rocket fire into the central uh, part of Israel this morning. Hamas security prisoners stabbed guards at the uh, Ktsiot prison in southern Israel last night. Two prison guards have been taken to Soroka Medical Center, reported here by the Jewish press, in Beersheba after two Hamas terrorists. This is a prisoner of terrorists, a prison rather, of terrorists, um, after two Hamas terrorists launched an attack on Sunday night. One of the guards... Uh, the prison was seriously wounded and he was stabbed in the neck, transported to the hospital. Second guard has sustained sustained a less serious wound to the shoulder. Um, so perhaps there's some correlation there between the Hamas. Not that they, you know, they'll find any excuse in the world. It's, it's unbelievable when you have stories like this, when Hamas carries out uh, attacks and in many cases, Israel will, will respond. And then because Israel responds, then Hamas threatens, um, you know, as if Israel was the aggressor. And this happens time time and time again. And we'll see if there's any correlation. But it really is, there's no difference. They'll use any excuse, whether it's Hamas or Islamic Jihad, any excuse to try to attack Israel, try to murder Jews. It doesn't matter really what's going on. They will, they will claim it, it's something, uh, something's bothering them that they have a reason behind it. They don't have a reason. They have excuses, and they use them time and time again to attack Israel. We're going to take a break right now, and when we come back, Yisrael Maidad, to talk about the impact of the announcement that the U.S. is recognizing full Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. My name is Josh Haston. This is Israel Uncensored on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. Thanks so much for joining us here on a cloudy and rainy but still beautiful Monday, March 25th, 2019, here in Jerusalem, the 18th of Adar, Bet 5779. Take a short break, and we'll be right back. Tune in for an exclusive interview with Mayor of Efrat, Oded Revivi, the first official representative from Judea and Samaria to speak at the APAC conference. He said, I don't agree with Oded. I don't come from the same political background. But the way he presented the information, the way he showed us reality, is an important thing that should be on the stage in the main conference. For the full interview, check out Rejuvenation with Eve Harrow on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. And we are back. Josh Hasted here, Israel Uncensored, on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com. It is Monday, the 25th of March, 2019, the 18th of Adar, Bet 5779. We're going to go to the phone right now, speaking to a good friend, Israel Winky Maydad, 
Research Fellow at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center in Jerusalem. He's also a renowned writer and columnist for the Jerusalem Post, and he writes in, in many other places and blogs, always keeping um, track of breaking events, current events, and his pulse on everything related to Israel and the Jewish people. Winky, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Joss, and thank you for that introduction. Well, I want to talk about the Golan Heights, but uh, before we get to that, of course, uh, just your quick reaction. A missile fired from Gaza into the Sharon region uh, in Israel this morning. Seven people wounded, one moderately. Your reaction to this morning's uh, attack? Well, this is the second error that Hamas has made in uh, as many weeks. <laughs> yeah, right, an error. Okay, uh, and as we say in Hebrew, uh, a, a mistake always comes back. So either Israel has to make Hamas a mistake, or Israel will be making a mistake. I am not saying a war, I am not saying a major conflagration here. I'm talking about a very firm response. Uh, obviously, uh, we could use the Egyptians on this because I read a report you probably did uh, about a week ago uh, that uh, the Egyptians are very angry at uh, Hamas. Uh, they have to realize that there's a lot they can lose. Uh, their population, by the way, Josh, one of the things that we've been actually pushing for for years, they should make a revolt against their own regime. Uh, we saw some of that over the weekend. Maybe we can do more in that direction of subverting Hamas from within. Uh, but uh, obviously, Mr. Uh, Netanyahu, faced with pressure both from an anxious public and the elections coming up, needs to do something much more, and we expect it of him. I agree with you completely. I hope the revolt comes from within. I, I don't personally don't want to see any idea of troops in Gaza. Uh, I would rather see their own people uh, take over. Uh, to overthrow Hamas down there. Now, going, turning our attention to the Golan, President Donald Trump, his tweet reads as following from March the 21st. After 52 years, it is time for the United States to fully recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights, which is of critical strategic and security importance to the state of Israel and regional stability, exclamation point. Now, by the time people hear this show, that might actually be in writing. I heard Ron Dermer, the ambassador, Israel's ambassador to the U.S. last night at APAC state that he expects the president to actually sign a document recognizing Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights in his meeting with Netanyahu today on Monday. What is the impact of this uh, latest development about the Golan? Well, first of all, I think it assures Israel security in the long term. Uh, uh, anybody who's been to Israel and has seen uh, from close up Golan Heights, either looking at it from the Kinneret Sea, the Sea of Galilee, or being on top and looking around and looking down at Damascus knows that it, it is a uh, the best security advantage we have, especially since Syria is becoming more and more under Iranian control. The situation in the Middle East is still not stable. The second thing is it again uh, confirms that the 67 war was a war of defense and legally Israel taking territory after uh, being attacked could keep that territory. And third, which is also relevant to the situation in Judea and Samaria, there is a long historical link between the Golan Heights and the Jewish people's history. The only reason we do not we did not have it in 1948 was because uh, the British wanted Mosul oil in Iraq, and they exchanged the territory that they had promised Israel uh, to France, and it was incorporated in Syria. So that was, uh, you know, a hundred years ago, colonial uh, machinations uh, between two imperial powers leaving us out. And I think all these three things now come together. So just to give people uh, some uh, background here, you had, you know, the San Remo conference back in, what was it, 19... Uh, 20. 1920 um, and uh, the Middle East this region was divided up and some areas went under the British mandate others were controlled by France and this area here under the League of Nations was supposed to be under the League of Nations under under British control including the Golan and then uh, the UK then I would say would you call it illegally turned over the Golan uh, to France back in what was it 1923 or so 
Yeah, they, they did a switch on us, uh, as they say. Uh, already in the 1880s, uh, land purchases had been made by Jews. Jews were living there in about, uh, I think, half a dozen small communities. Uh, so it wasn't as if this was foreign territory. Anybody who has been up there and has done archaeology research and stuff like that knows we have about 25 synagogues that have been discovered there. This is not foreign territory like Algeria is to France or Crimea is uh, to Russia. And, and therefore, all these things come together. And at that time, it, literally, it was stolen from us because the British wanted Iraqi oil. Uh-huh. So just to, to clarify for listeners, if you are, if we're talking about the Golan here, Israel has, number one, a historical connection. Number two, we have a security need to be up there. And number three, from a legal perspective, this was slated to be part, the Golan was slated to be part of the Jewish state of Israel and and the United Kingdom, the Brits illegally turned that area over to France. And then many, many years later, the establishment of the state of Israel, Israel reclaims the Golan in the 1967 defensive war of survival, which is very important. And then in 1981, Israel officially annex, annexes the Golan, yet the Reagan administration, which many consider to be a friendly administration towards Israel, in 1981, they did not even recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan. Isn't that correct? That's correct. The, the, the situation is, of course, that many, too many diplomats uh, want a final peace treaty as the only way to uh, adjudicate exactly which territory should belong to one country. But given, as you adequately said, the three points of history, security, and uh, uh, legal aspects uh, in the original mandate uh, situation, Israel has full claim, and we don't need to have a signed treaty, especially as we know, Syria is not going to sign a treaty with us. It's backed by Iran. It's backed by uh, an irrational family that is uh, dedicated to el eliminating Israel. Uh, we don't have to wait for peace treaties in order to establish our right to be on the map in the Middle East. How do you explain if, and this may be a complicated question. I mean, I don't have an explanation, you know, certainly not when it comes to Judea and Samaria and the importance of it from all the same for the same reasons as the Golan for security, legality, his history, uh, history, historical perspective. I, you know, on social media, you have diplomats or, or former diplomats, and then you have. I don't even want to call them uh, Jewish. Maybe we'll call them so-called Jewish organizations who went crazy over the Trump declaration, saying exactly the opposite, saying Israel has no legal right, Israel has, uh, they didn't mention the history because then they would get into trouble, that Israel has no legal right, and it does not enhance, I saw a group well, say, Israel has, this will not enhance Israel's security. I think it was the Jewish Democrats or something like that. I don't even know who they are. Well, well just you have to realize, our opponents, shall I call them, uh, will use any argument to uh, uh, move their agenda forward. Many years right here in Israel that we have to deal with an American administration. We can't uh, rebel, we can't get them, make them angry or upset. And it came, of course, uh, to a crisis, both at the Bush senior and then Obama. And, and now that we have an American president that's basically walking in line with Israel, not only Israel, with, with Mr. Netanyahu, they still have trouble uh, accepting the fact that Israel, after so many years, has finally made its case to many politicians and diplomats, including now, as we see, uh, countries coming to s set up uh, diplomatic relations in, in Jerusalem, whether it's embassies, whether it's uh, diplomatic offices or on the way, interim uh, uh, situation. Everything is coming our way. They're still upset and angry. Israel is a success story. Zionism has won the battle for the Jewish mind and for the relationship in many cases of non-Jews toward us, especially with evangelicals. Uh, and instead of pushing and pulling along with us in this direction, they s tend to tear things down. It's unfortunate. I might even have to say that it's a Jewish uh, characterization, unfortunately, that no one wants to agree with anybody else. But we're moving forward, Josh, and I think that uh, eventually more people will come to terms with the reality that we are establishing here in the state of Israel. 
So last question before we let you go, just in general, the upcoming, uh, perhaps upcoming uh, revelation of what the Trump deal of the century, as it's called, perha uh, perhaps will be presented after the Israeli election. There are people who are optimistic. There are people who are pessimistic in between, nervous, anxious, excited, happy. What what just based again, not nobody really knows what's in the plan. What is your gut tell you? in terms of uh, what the, the plan will what the plan will, will, will be and in terms of whether or not you are optimistic, pessimistic, worried, concerned, or do you think that since Trump basically has done everything right until now when it comes to Israel that we have nothing to worry about? What is it to you? Well, Josh, let's look at this. We have Trump, Bolton, and Pompeo. And I think that uh, that weighs heavily in our favor, according to the past record. On the other hand, I still think that the State Department has an amazing amount of power. Uh, and therefore, they're trying to um, make a situation uh, in which we still go along with perhaps two state solution uh, or this or that. I have the feeling, though, that uh, both Jason Greenblatt and Jared Kushner have put into the plan enough um, trip wires for the Palestinian Arab uh, uh, National Authority uh, to say no. Uh, Jerusalem, refugees, and a few other things like that. And I think that's going to be a very delicate tightrope uh, tight walk, both for Netanyahu and Trump, by putting out uh, a little bit for the uh, Palestinian Authority to say enough to so that we can move on forward. So I'm anxious. I've never been uh, sitting on laurels, uh, but I think that we have a more positive uh, future for us rather than a negative one. We are out of time, but we could definitely speak all day about these issues and many more with a true, true jewel of the Jewish people. And you could see from his knowledge base that he's a true resource uh, and should be utilized. So get in touch with Israel Medad Winky. What is the best way for people to reach you if they want to learn more about your work, your analysis, uh, or your work for the Begin Center? I am on Facebook, Israel Medad, on Twitter, and my main blog is My Right Word, R I G H T. And uh, I welcome anybody to come along and uh, engage in dialogue. Thank you so much for your time, Israel Winky May Dodd. Maybe another day we'll talk about how you got that nickname. But uh, we are out. Of, we're out of time for today on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Let's be safe. Let's hear good, good news. No more rockets on Israel, whether it's in the middle of the country or down in the south. It doesn't matter to me. No rockets, and we'll have to wait for the prime minister to come back. Uh, by tomorrow and see what type of response Israel will deliver to Hamas. So thanks very much. Have a great day. Let's all be safe. Josh, thank you very much. And no balloons either. Yeah, bye that's bye. right. No balloons, no terror kites, no explosives, no border breaches, none of that stuff down from our uh, our neighbors there in our unfriendly neighbors down in Gaza. That's going to do it for today. If you missed any part of the show, you can always listen to it again on the land of Israel dot com. Uh, website on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, iTunes, and uh, make sure you get in touch with me during the week. If you have any questions, comments on the program, Josh at the land of Israel .com. on Facebook, it is Joshua Haston or my new page, Josh Haston Israel Advocacy and Journalism on Twitter at Josh Haston, and now as well on Instagram. I'm still learning it, but hopefully I'll be able to figure out Instagram and how to best utilize it here in the near future. Big shout out to Benjamin Bresky. Without him, there's no sound. You cannot get these broadcasts up. And to Tabitha Epstein for all the work she does. Signing out here for Monday, the 25th of March, 2019, the 18th of Adar Bet, 5779, from a pretty cold and rainy but still beautiful Jerusalem morning here. Most importantly, between now and when we speak again next week, please God, everyone out there in the wonderful world of ours, be safe. Shalom from Jerusalem.